All right. Today we're going to go through motion in two and three dim dimensions. So this is extending what you learned in the last chapter to talk about what happens when you also have to consider other directions. We're going to start by, re by reviewing some extensions of vectors to three dimensions. This somewhat overlaps with chapter two, but if vectors were entirely new to you in chapter two, this it, it, it probably didn't all stick, so we're going to refresh a little bit. Um, when you have, uh, when you're only considering one plane, you have coordinates in X and Y. When you're considering three dimensions, you have coordinates in X, Y, and Z. Um, bear with me here because my stylus isn't working, so I'm having to use my finger. Um, if we want to talk about the displacement of point P from the vertex, um, we now are going to have three coordinates in our vector. We're going to have the displacement R is equal to X, Y, Z, or I can also write it X, X hat plus Y, Y hat plus Z, Z hat. Now I prefer X hat, Y hat, Z hat. Um, you will also see I hat, K hat, and or I hat, J hat, and K hat. X hat, Y hat, and Z hat seem more intuitive to me, so that's my preferred notation. So now we're going to talk about the displacement to, between two vectors. So most of physics, your, your choice of coordinate system is completely arbitrary. So we're often describing things by the relative position of two points um, rather than the absolute position. So if we want the difference in position, let's say in the way this is drawn, the a particle might move from point P1 at time T1 to point P2 at time T2. I don't want to write all of those subscripts because it's very hard in general with a stylus on a whiteboard on Zoom, but it's even harder with your finger. Um, so we're going to write this as R2 which is the final position, minus R1. Anytime that we're using a delta, we always do final minus initial. And so sear that into your brain right now. So that's going to be X2, Y2, Z2, minus X1, Y1, Z1. And then we can write this. I'm going to move it down here because it's going to be long. That's x2 minus x1, comma, y2 minus y1, comma, z2 minus z1. So that is the displacement of point 2 relative to point 1. All right, so here's how you could draw the, how you could represent the displacement of, for instance, a satellite from Earth. Um, and this is putting the origin of the coordinate system at the center of the Earth. I want to stress again, your choice of origin, your choice of coordinate systems is ultimately arbitrary. There are choices that make problems easier to solve and problem, make problems harder to solve. So you're often trying to look for a clever choice that makes the math less ugly. But if you choose this choice, um, you would, if you have a satellite move from this position here um, to that position, um, you would do the same thing. The, uh, your delta R, whoop, bear with me, your delta R is going to equal the 
final R minus the initial R. Same thing as on the previous slide. Um, and just like when you're working in two dimensions, you can represent a vector by its magnitude and its angle instead of its coordinates. So this is taking the um, something similar to the vector that was on the previous slide. Uh, this is not quite the same vector, but you're you're breaking this delta r into a component along the x-axis and a component along the i the y-axis. Now I do want to stress this is often the choice of coordinate systems we choose relative to the Earth but it is ultimately arbitrary. Here you can see an example of a particle undergoing Brownian motion. Brownian motion is what particles do, for instance, in a liquid when they're moving around, but not in a, they're not in a straight path um, because they're going through collisions with things, for instance, in the liquid. Um, so you can see here the, um, the displacements at each given point relative to the previous point, but your total final displacement is only impacted by whatever the initial position is and whatever the final position is. And finally, what we're really working for is, is describing the trajectory of particles. Um, and you can, so here this is in two dimensions because it's a lot easier to draw in two dimensions than three dimensions. And we are looking at the displacement of a particle relative to its it, over some interval time delta t. Um, so we can approximate the velocity as the change in the position vector divided by the time. Now, as you make this time interval shorter and shorter and shorter, it's going to get closer and closer to the tangent to the, the particle. And mathematically, we can write, we can say that we, as we take, when we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, we get dr dt, the actual derivative. And that derivative itself is the velocity. Um, now we often can use this form, delta r over delta t. Um, you can use it exactly if the velocity is constant, um, it, because or sorry, you can use it exactly if the velocity is um, if the velocity is zero or in one direction and it's not rotating, um, there's a few cases you can use it exactly. You often can use it approximately, um, which is very useful to get some feel for what you should do so that when you charge ahead and you use fancy math that you might not be totally comfortable in, you can at least qualitatively check that your answer is right. A lot of working through the toolkit that you need as a physicist is learning how to cross check your work because you will make mistakes. The difference between a novice and an expert is not whether or not they're making mistakes, it's whether or not they're able to catch their mistakes along the way. Okay, so now we're going to move to free fall in three dimensions. And I'm going to set some problems up, but I'm not actually going to solve them. Um, when you work in three dimensions, um, you can break each component into different pieces. So there's an implicit coordinate system. What I would like you to do when you're working through your problems is draw it explicitly to make sure that it's very, very clear. This is going to help you as well as me and the TA who's grading your homework. Um, the more explicit you are, the better. So by default, we work in a coordinate system with x along the um, x parallel to the ground and y perpendicular to the ground. Now, this is physics. You could choose to be difficult and choose to call that 
Z instead of Y, or uh, you could orient, you could have all the motion in the X direction. If the problem doesn't specify, we have to accept it anyways. Um, but you're probably gonna find it a lot easier to just use the most straightforward coordinate system. Now, when we have motion in more than one dimension, we can split it apart into, um, into different coordinates. So when we have these um, free fall problems, you have um, a set of equations that you can use. Um, the velocity at some final time is equal to the initial velocity um, plus the acceleration times time. The position as a function of time is equal to the initial position. Um, plus the velocity initially times time plus one half times the acceleration t squared. Now in most of these problems, the acceleration is negative g. Um, and then we have another version, which is the one that I always forget, v squared equals v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2a delta x. Now I've written these for x. When you move into three dimensions, when you move into two dimensions, you have another set of equations that is all for the y axis. And another set of equations is all for the z axis when you move into three dimensions. And when you move into more than one dimensions, I recommend adding subscripts to everything so that you don't forget which coordinate you're working with. Um, most of the time, you, the what's initially hard is setting up the problem saying what you know and what you don't know. And then once you've set it up, then you do a bunch of algebra and that's where people make a lot of the mistakes is actually in, in the algebra. So this is your toolkit and you're gonna be using it in most problems um, where you're dealing with free fall. And some of, um, some of what you're going to be doing is trying to figure out the cleverest way to solve that tool, to use those equations in your toolkit um, to solve the problem. And I will say, there's a redundancy that v squared, that the equation involving v squared is redundant with the other equations, but it's a pain to rederive. So I wouldn't recommend rederiving it every time. Okay, so when you have the, when you break, when you have motion in more than one dimension, you can break the um, motion into motion in each of the directions separately. When you do that, um, you will see, for instance, that something that is some projectile only has acceleration in the y direction if you've drawn the coordinate system the way you usually do and then along the x direction the velocity is constant so in this case where there is a soccer ball um, being kicked the velocity in the x direction is constant and in the y direction it, there's some initial velocity upwards and it is constantly decreasing because of gravity so the net effect is that this soccer ball has a, uh, the soccer ball's trajectory is a parabola. Here you can see what's going on in here. Here's that complicated system of subscripts. It is a little tricky to work with at first, but I would recommend being, if anything, over meticulous about subscripts um, because it's going to, otherwise, you're going to accidentally set the initial y velocity equal to the initial x velocity and it's going to give you a wildly wrong answer. Okay, so steps. You first break the problem into two inde independent directions along the vertical and the horizontal axes. This is for two dimensional. Um, the horizontal motion is simple because you basically have constant velocity. Um, and that means that in those sets of equations, a lot of, you have a lot of zeros. Um, and the, the velocity starts to decrease at the very top 
the velocity in the y direction is zero. Um, and then it starts to fall towards Earth again. And, but you need both sets of equations to, to solve the whole problem. And I would just like, so here, this is using complicated sets of subscripts. The x and vy are the x and y coordinates in each at each given instant. Um, this, your book often uses zero for the initial, so v zero. I tend to prefer v initial because then I can explicitly label the initial and the final velocity as opposed to um, v zero doesn't have a good counterpart for the final velocity. Here's an example. Um, you're given the um, final height and the final um, and the final motion along the x direction. And um, this doesn't actually give you a problem to solve, um, but we can make one up. Um, and we can say, well, what is that initial velocity? So what you have here, you're given, so you have, you have your set of equations, which I'm gonna try to, um, I'm going to try to sneak in. So you have the velocity final is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. The x position is equal to the initial x position plus the initial velocity times time um, plus one half times the acceleration times time squared. Now here, I'm gonna add X subscripts to everything because um, we're working in two dimensions. And I also have the final squared equals the initial squared plus two times the acceleration delta x. Remember delta x is x final minus x initial. Okay, so now if I wanna do this problem and figure out what was that initial velocity that led to that um, trajectory, I see, I actually know the acceleration in the y direction and I know the initial and the final well, the final velocity is what I'm after. And I know the, or sorry, the initial velocity is what I'm after. I know the final velocity is zero at the very top. Um, so I can write in the y direction, zero equals V initial Y squared. And then there's a minus sign because my acceleration is negative G. And then it, this problem calls delta y h instead. So we're just gonna use h because that's what's used in the problem. I can convert the, um, I can break this initial velocity down into the, its components. So it's v naught cosine theta x hat plus v naught sine theta y hat so i can even just by having so just by having the position uh, along the, how high it travels i can actually get the initial velocity so I can write this as V naught squared sine squared theta equals to G H, or I can solve this and get V naught equals two G H, the square root of two G H over sine theta. So that's how far you would, how quickly you would have to shoot off the firework to get it to travel that, um, to get it to travel that high. 
And then you can also ask, for instance, how long it takes um, to get there. It, and if you wanted to do that, you now know the, um, you actually know the initial velocity and the final velocity. So you can say v final y equals zero equals that uh, v naught sine theta minus g t, and you can time how far it goes. I could ask a number of other questions about this. It's important when you're solving a problem to stop first and ask what you're trying to answer, because you often can answer a whole bunch of different things and you don't want to do more work than you have to. Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Now, as an intellectual exercise, if you're doing a homework problem, it doesn't matter if you do a little extra, but on an exam, it actually can kill a lot of time and, uh, and leave you at a disadvantage. Okay, here's another example. Um, I'm not gonna go through this in gory detail, but you can see, um, ah, you can see there is an implicit assumption that you have the, ba the same basic problem set up, the same coordinates. And then you have, I'm gonna nitpick the book notation there because it should actually have an absolute value for the magnitude or at least not have the vector symbol because it, you cannot set a vector equal to a scalar. And on an exam, you will get criticized for that. No. Okay, so you can calculate, given the velocity, you can calculate how, and this tells you how high up it travels. Um, so you could calculate how far away it's going to travel like that. All right. Now, these trajectories have a few different um, trends that you'll see. So let's say that you fix the angle um, and you want to get the trajectory, you want to get the object to travel further and further along the x-axis. If you increase the velocity, it will travel further and further along the x-axis. Now it happens that, uh, that a projectile will travel as the furthest distance if you launch it at an angle of 45 degrees. Um, if you launch, launch it less than 45 degrees or greater than 45 degrees, um, then there will be two angles where you can get it to travel the same distance along the x-axis. Um, and I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for the reader. Now, often when that's said, that means that it's a bunch of ugly algebra. If you are already comfortable with, um, with calculus, what you can do is you can do the calculate how far a projectile travels as a function of an arbitrary angle. Take the derivative with respect to that angle, set it equal to zero, and solve to figure out what the, the largest angle is. And that's how you can figure out that 45 degrees uh, will give you the largest, um, will give you the, um, will make it travel farthest. You actually can do it without calculus where you just look at the equations and go, oh, this is largest when the angle is 45 degrees. It's important to note you have these two solutions. So if you were asked what angle a projectile was fired off at, given that it lands a certain distance away, there are two answers um, that if, um, so it's, it's gonna depend. Um, and be aware that there are two answers. And sometimes when there's two mathematical answers allowed, you have to be very meticulous and look at which one is physical. So which one physically could have happened? Um, here you can see more of the same. If you have a, a golf ball and you hit it, um, there's two different angles. Um, it, there's, you can get the, the same range with two different, um, with totally different angles and speeds. So this distance traveled is not unique. Um, it, and the angle is not unique. 
There's multiple ways to get to the same answer. All right, a special case of uh, motion in two and three dimensions is circular motion. Um, this is really, really useful. For instance, you can approximate the motion of the planets as roughly circular. Um, and we will do that later in the semester. Um, so steer this into your brain. Now, um, if you have, for instance, if you have something traveling around the earth um, and you shoot it off at, with a velocity parallel to the surface of the earth, um, it is only going to experience acceleration um, perpendicular to the, uh, it's, perpendicular to the surface of the earth, it's always going to be accelerating towards the center of the earth. Um, and if you do it just right, as it travels around, it's, it's always falling towards the center of the earth, but the center of the earth is moving further away as it, um, because the center of the earth, uh, so this, sorry, the surface of the earth is, is curved. So the surface of the earth is always moving further away. So a satellite is essentially falling constantly around the center of the earth. Um, and when you have this special case where you have some type of circular motion, you can, I can tell you what the acceleration is. The acceleration is going to be the velocity squared divided by the distance uh, um, from the center of rotation. So A equals V squared over R. Um, when we add in gravity, we can start talking about um, what that actual force is, but we haven't gotten to the to forces yet. So, so um, when this is your acceleration, you, I can tell you what your acceleration is if you're moving in a circular orbit with a given speed. Um, sear it into your brain. Um, here you can see this graphically that that acceleration is always moving toward the, the center. So you have um, an object moving in this case, counterclockwise, we always by convention have theta increasing. So your object is moving counterclockwise around the um, around the center. Um, oh, you wanted if you wanted clockwise, it would just change the the sign of theta. Not a big deal, but by convention, positive is counterclockwise. Um, so if you have an object which is at position r at a given time and then it moves to r plus uh, to at time a different r at r, t plus delta t um, you can calculate the change in position with this delta r and then your um, at each point you have a velocity like that you can calculate delta v and drawn pictorially you can see delta v is pointing towards the center of the circle now this type of acceleration is called centripetal, not centrifugal. Um, centripetal acceleration, that means moving in a circle. Um, so anytime you have something moving, moving in a circle, its net acceleration is, at a constant speed, its net acceleration is towards the center. Um, when you have something moving around in a circle at a constant speed, it also, Ex exhibits oscillatory motion. So if you um, break the, the position vector into its components, the position vector is just going to be the magnitude of the position vector cosine theta. And here we're writing, we're saying theta is changing at a constant angle. So omega t, so theta is changing at a constant speed. So the theta is equal to omega t. So your position vector is r cosine theta omega hat plus r sine theta y hat. Um, so in any given dimension, if you look at the x position, it's moving sinusoidally along the x-axis, back and forth sinusoidally. It's doing the same thing along the y-axis. And that means that you can actually connect circular motion to a lot of other oscillatory behavior, which we're going to build up later in the semester. Here you can just see a very special case of oscillatory motion. Um, this is a this is for a proton, um, and you can see that you know this is very specific numbers. 
Um, and you can calculate how long it takes for evolution. We will cover oscillatory motion in greater detail later. Now you don't, you are not restricted only to centripetal acceleration. You can have something speeding up or slowing down as it moves in a circle. And when you do that, the, you can have a transverse acceleration as well. Um, so instead of breaking the acceleration into X and Y components, it happens to be more useful when you're talking about circular motion to break it up into centripetal and transverse accelerations. And this is just doing that for a specific case with hard numbers. But it's the same thing that you've done before, breaking a vector into its components. components. Now, relative motion. You guys already make assumptions about relative motion, even if you're not realizing it, um, because the Earth is actually a moving coordinate system. So we are on a moving coordinate system. But let's say that you are tossing a ball on a train. Um, when you're tossing a ball on a train, you don't have to worry about the fact the train's moving because both you and the, um, and the ball are moving relative to the train. That's no, right, both you and the ball are moving relative to the ground together at the same speed. So you don't worry, you just toss your ball. It doesn't feel any different to toss a ball up and down in the air on a train than it does when you're on the ground. Okay, so when we have, uh, um, this is bad conversion, but I just used the slides from the publisher. When you are um, calculating the, um, by convention, when you're calculating the velocity of one object relative to another, um, and this was a specific problem that I don't remember which problem it was, but the velocity of one object, did we have that? Okay. The velocity of one object um, relative to the other is going to be one object relative to, um, oh, sorry, the velocity of something relative to the earth is going to be the velocity of something relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the earth. And the conventions for subscripts, you often put them in order so that you can see how they, so you can see how you would write it if you, um, if you want the velocity of the earth. So you can just say, okay, well, I'm gonna smush those train um, subscripts together. Okay, so if the velocity of the train with respect to the earth is 10 meters per second, and you are going at two meters per second relative to, on the train, so you're running backwards on the train, your net velocity with respect to the earth is just the sum of those two and you get eight meters per second. You can do this for coordinate systems as well, and we're not going to go as heavy into this in this class as you would do in upper division mechanics, but you then would have two, you can think of this as two coordinate systems. One coordinate system where the origin is at the earth, and one coordinate system where the origin is on the train, and what the two things that you are actually usually interested in it are someone's position relative to the earth and someone's position relative to the train they are connected by this position of the origin of the this vector which gives the displacement of the origin of the coordinate systems relative to each other so the position of the train relative to the earth um, so an example is that you have a car traveling east towards a, um, towards a truck, towards an intersection and a truck traveling south towards the same intersection. And um, then you're interested in what their velocity relative to each other is. And the reason why you're interested in that velocity is because that tells you how bad the crash is. Um, so the velocity of the car relative to the truck is the sum of the velocity of the car relative to the earth plus the velocity of the earth of the of the truck relative to the earth okay so we are going to stop there
and I will see you for chapter five.